Welcome to the training entitled Preventing Foodborne Illness in Young Children, Safe Handling of Foods in Child Care Settings, sponsored by UGA Extension and the Georgia Department of Agriculture. The goal of this session is to present information about how foodborne illnesses affect young children, about the serious short-term and long-term health effects, and the serious complications that can occur when children get sick from food that they eat, and to present simple steps you can take in child care settings to prevent these illnesses from occurring. My name is Judy Harrison and I'm a professor and Extension Food Safety Specialist with UGA Extension in the University of Georgia's College of Family and Consumer Sciences. Joining me is Jessica Bedour, a Recall Outreach Specialist with the Georgia Department of Agriculture's Food Safety Division. The topics we will address include an explanation of what foodborne illness is, commonly called food poisoning, how foodborne illness affects children both short-term and possibly long-term, the symptoms of foodborne illness and how to prevent illness, food recalls and how these can help prevent foodborne illness outbreaks, and again, we will have some questions and scenarios along the way so you can check what you learn. And when we get to these, we will pause for a minute to give you time to think about what your answer would be, and then we will share the correct answer with you. According to statistics from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, one in every six Americans gets sick each year from illnesses caused by food they eat. This results in 128,000 hospitalizations and about 3,000 deaths from food in the U.S. each year. So what is foodborne illness? What causes it, and how do we get it? Foodborne illness is defined as any disease caused by food that you eat or beverages that you drink. When disease-causing microorganisms referred to as pathogens get into food, they can result in illness. Regardless of the cause, the symptoms of foodborne illness are similar, with the most common symptoms being diarrhea, vomiting, nausea, abdominal pain, and in some cases, fever. So let's take a look at what causes foodborne illness and how we get it. Some foodborne illnesses are caused by bacteria, like salmonella, Campylobacter, E. coli 0157H7, and Shigella. Others are caused by viruses. In childcare settings, norovirus and rotavirus are the two most common causes of many illnesses. They are very infectious and they can be spread from person to person among the children as well as through contaminated food. In child care environments, these can spread very quickly. Even parasites cause foodborne illness. The parasite Cryptosporidium is a common cause of diarrhea in children, especially in child care settings. Because the parasite is in the feces, anything that gets contaminated by feces can potentially spread the parasite. As a result, it can be spread directly from person to person through contact with contaminated objects such as toys or by swallowing contaminated food or water. And this could either be drinking water or recreational water from pools and splash pads. And recently, there was a cryptosporidium outbreak associated with splash pads. 
Crypto outbreaks in childcare settings are most common during late summer and early fall, or August through September, but they can occur at any time. The spread of cryptosporidiosis is highest among young children who are not yet toilet trained and the caregivers who change their diapers. This means that good hygiene practices are an absolute must when it comes to preventing cryptosporidiosis outbreaks. Giardia is another parasite, a parasitic protozoan that is often associated with contaminated water. But again, it can be spread through contact with contaminated objects as well. Children are even more at risk for foodborne illness and complications that can result from it than healthy adults. And there are two reasons why. In children, the immune system is not as fully developed as in adults, and that makes it harder for them to fight off disease. Children also have a lower body weight, so it may not take as many organisms or as much toxin, if it's a toxin-producing organism, to make them sick. The results, children are more likely to become ill than adults, and they're more likely to have serious complications. One of the most common complications is dehydration resulting from vomiting and diarrhea. But additional complications can include bloodstream infections, seizures, reactive arthritis, which is a type of joint pain that occurs after certain bouts of diarrheal illness and can last indefinitely, kidney disease caused by hemolytic uremic syndrome, which is often associated with E. coli 0157H7. HUS is most common in children and is the most common cause of acute kidney failure in children. And then, of course, the worst case complication is death. A recent study that was published in the Pediatric Infectious Disease Journal estimated that just five types of bacteria cause almost 300,000 illnesses each year in children under the age of five, resulting in over 100,000 doctor visits, almost 8,000 hospitalizations, and 64 deaths. The Centers for Disease Control and Prevention tell us that in 2013, children less than five years of age had high rates of illnesses caused by Salmonella, Campylobacter, Shigella, E. coli 0157H7, Yersinia, and the parasite Cryptosporidium. These bar graphs represent the rate of illnesses per 100,000 people in various age groups caused by different pathogens. The black bars represent children under the age of five. It is easy to see the incidence of these illnesses in young children compared to other age groups. Here we see bacterial illnesses caused by Campylobacter, Salmonella, which is the highest, and Shigella. And in this slide, we see illnesses from toxin-producing E. coli and from Yersinia and Listeria, which are, again, bacteria that cause illness. And then this graph also shows illnesses from the parasite Cryptosporidium. You can see that children less than five years of age are very much at risk for these illnesses. 
But the leading cause of foodborne illness in young children, as in other population groups, is a virus, norovirus. Norovirus is estimated to result in more than 14,000 hospitalizations, 281,000 emergency room visits, and more than 627,000 outpatient doctor visits each year at a cost of more than $273 million. The costs for norovirus estimated here are for treatment in cases where hospitalizations occurred, emergency medical treatment is necessary, etc. Typically, when we estimate foodborne illness costs, we include things like medical treatment costs, emergency medical visits, lost productivity from work, etc. So where do these illnesses occur? Well, in 2013, in Georgia, most outbreaks of foodborne illness occurred in nursing homes among yet another vulnerable population, but 27% of outbreaks occurred in childcare and in schools. So now, let's review what you've learned so far by answering a few questions. The first one, foodborne illness or food poisoning is any disease caused by food or beverages. True or false? The correct answer is A, true. Now let's try this one. Children are more at risk for foodborne illness and serious complications than adults because blank. A, they put toys in their mouths. B, their immune systems are not as fully developed as an adult. C, their body weight is lower, so it does not take as many germs or as much toxin to make them sick. D, all of the above, or E, B and C above. The answer is E, B and C above. Their immune systems are not as fully developed as an adult, and they don't weigh as much as an adult, so fewer germs or less toxin is needed to make them ill. Most cases of foodborne illness in children under age 5 are caused by blank. A, Campylobacter, B, Cryptosporidium, C, E. coli 0157H7, or D, Norovirus. If you said Norovirus, then you are correct. Now that we know about the risk for foodborne illness in children, Jessica will give you some more in-depth information about types of illnesses and what can be done to prevent these. Thanks, Judy. Now we're going to take a closer look at some of the differences between bacteria, viruses, and parasites and ways to control them. Bacteria are single-celled living microorganisms that can multiply in food when the conditions are favorable. Bacteria especially like warm, moist environments. To help control bacteria in foods, it's important to take steps to prevent food from becoming contaminated in the first place. Control temperatures and conditions that would allow them to multiply, and cook foods to the recommended endpoint temperatures to ensure that disease-causing bacteria are destroyed. Viruses are simply pieces of the proteins RNA or DNA. They require a host in order to replicate themselves. So in other words, they do not multiply in food. So the best way to avoid illnesses from viruses is through cleanliness, 
good sanitation practices, and good personal hygiene, which will all help prevent viruses from being spread to foods or objects. Parasites also cannot multiply in foods. They need a living host in order to multiply. They can be single-celled organisms or multicellular. Many parasites are able to survive in the environment and infect people after they are ingested. To control parasites, purchase food only from reputable sources, avoid contaminated water sources and food that has come into contact with animal waste, and always cook food to recommended endpoint temperatures. This slide provides some great resources with additional information about foodborne illness and food safety. They provide science-based information that can help you keep children safe. You'll find links to federal and state regulatory public health and food safety agencies, as well as UGA's site for extension and the Partnership for Food Safety Education. If you think a child in your care may have a foodborne illness, you'll want to follow your state agency or sponsoring organization's standard policies and procedures for getting medical care for any sick children. You'll want to report suspected foodborne illnesses to your local health department. And it's important to know who your local health inspector is so that you have that connection already made. It is also important to keep any samples and the packaging of foods served to children in your care for up to three days. This can help determine if a particular food caused the foodborne illness or if the illness came from another source. We've already covered some of the ways to control foodborne pathogens. Now we're going to talk about the four basic steps to keeping food safe. These are one, clean, two, separate, three, cook, and four, chill. One of the most important steps in cleaning is hand washing. To wash your hands properly, you'll want to wet your hands with warm water and apply soap. Wash your hands for at least 20 seconds, vigorously rubbing all parts of the hands. You can also sing the happy birthday song twice from start to finish, and that's about 20 seconds as well. Clean under your fingernails where germs are likely to hide. Jewelry should not be worn when preparing food as it can become a source of contamination and could also be a physical hazard if it were to get lost in the food. A physical hazard is one that can cause physical harm such as cuts, scratches, or choking. After washing your hands, dry them on a clean, single-use paper towel or use a hot air dryer. It is important in childcare settings to help children wash their hands properly. This includes any time they use the restroom, after they cough or sneeze, after they come into contact with animals or animal cages, after they've been outside playing on the playground, before and after they help with any food prep, and always before meals. As a child care provider, it's important to wash hands as well for yourself after using the restroom, after changing diapers, after you cough or sneeze or help a child wipe his or her nose, after tending to anyone who is sick, after coming into contact with animals or animal cages, before and after preparing, serving, handling, or eating food, and also when switching between tasks during food preparation. In other words, wash your hands often and wash them well. Clean means to clean everything in the kitchen, including food prep areas, in order to prevent foods from becoming cross-contaminated. It can help if you have written procedures for how and when to clean and a system in place so that you are routinely cleaning utensils, cutting boards, workspaces, any food processing equipment, countertops, etc. You'll also want to sanitize food preparation surfaces after washing and rinsing them. You want to use hot water and soap or a dishwasher. And always use clean cloth towels or paper towels. Try to avoid reusing towels and avoid using sponges because they have a lot of nooks and crannies where germs can hide and they stay moist for long periods of time. That creates a harborage for germs. 
An effective and inexpensive sanitizing solution can be made using water and unscented chlorine bleach. The maximum concentration allowed on food contact surfaces is 200 parts per million. What does that mean? If you use one tablespoon of plain, unscented household bleach mixed with one gallon of water, you'll get the concentration of 200 parts per million. This solution can be used as spray or as a soak for immersing items. It's important to remember that chlorine evaporates, so the solution will lose strength over time. If you're using it in a spray bottle, you should make the solution fresh each day. If you're using it as a soak, immerse items such as utensils or even toys for at least one minute and then allow them to air dry. Solutions for soaking should be made fresh at each meal period. Items should be rinsed thoroughly first to remove any detergent before placing them in the sanitizing solution. Detergent and any soap residue may interfere with the action of the chlorine, so the solution is less effective if any residues are present. When it comes to cleaning foods, it's important to rinse all fresh fruits and vegetables just before you peel them, cut them, cook them, or eat them raw. After rinsing, dry them with a clean paper towel. Thick skinned produce, such as apples or melons, should be scrubbed with a clean, sanitized veggie brush. You'll also want to wash the tops of cans and dry them with a paper towel or a clean cloth towel before opening them with a can opener. And while it may be tempting, tempting, do not rinse raw poultry, meat, fish, or seafood, as this is a way to actually spread contamination throughout the kitchen. Instead, you just need to be sure that you're cooking to recommended endpoint temperatures in order to kill any harmful microorganisms that may be present. It's also important to keep areas where food will be served clean. Keep books, book bags, backpacks, toys, etc. off of the tables where food will be served. Wash the tables with soap and hot water, dry surfaces with clean paper towels, and then use a sanitizing solution or a spray to sanitize the surfaces. Let's review what we just discussed by answering another question. Hands should be washed for at least blank. A, one minute. B, 40 seconds. C, 20 seconds. Or D, 10 seconds. The correct answer is for at least 20 seconds using warm running water and soap and rubbing hands vigorously. The second step to keeping food safe is to separate. Place raw meats, poultry, and seafood in plastic bags and keep them separate from other foods when you're shopping. Store the raw meat, poultry, or seafood on a plate in a container or in a sealed bag on the bottom shelf of the refrigerator so that juices cannot drip onto any other foods. You may also decide to use one cutting board for fresh produce or ready-to-eat foods and a separate cutting board for raw meat, poultry, and seafood. Some people like to color coordinate so you always know that you're using for example, a red cutting board for your raw meat and poultry, and a green cutting board for any fresh produce or ready-to-eat foods. Either way, you always want to place cooked foods on clean plates, not on plates that have been exposed to any raw meat juices that could recontaminate the cooked products. The third step to keeping food safe to eat is to cook. Cook to proper recommended temperatures or higher. Using a food thermometer is the only way to know for sure when foods have reached the necessary temperatures to destroy harmful microorganisms. Always use a clean, calibrated food thermometer and know exactly how to use it. You want to check to be sure the interior of the food has, a, has reached at least the minimum recommended temperature in the thickest part of the food away from any bones. The current recommendations for the lowest temperatures that foods should reach and are safe are 145 degrees Fahrenheit for beef, lamb, veal, and pork steaks, roasts, and chops. And that includes a resting time of about three minutes for the meat to sit before you carve or serve it. 
160 degrees Fahrenheit for ground beef, pork, veal, and lamb, and any egg dishes. 165 degrees Fahrenheit for chicken and turkey, whether it's whole, pieces, or ground. And 165 degrees Fahrenheit for casseroles and leftover foods, or foods that have been made ahead but were not previously served. Remember that these are the lowest or minimum temperatures that food can reach to be safe. It's okay to cook them to a higher temperature if you prefer. Thermometers need to be calibrated every so often to be accurate. It's important to do this on a routine basis and any time after the thermometer may have been accidentally dropped. To calibrate a thermometer, prepare a mixture that is half ice and half water. Insert the stem of the thermometer into the slurry and stir it around. Wait at least 30 seconds, then take a reading. If the temperature does not read 32 degrees Fahrenheit, then adjust the calibration nut that is under the head of the thermometer. If you are using a microwave oven to prepare any foods, you only want to use micro microwave safe cookware. Follow the package directions carefully. And when cooking, be sure to cover, stir, and rotate the food to prevent any cold spots. It's also very important to observe stand times on the package directions, as this is considered part of the cooking process. If no standing time is listed, wait at least one minute after the heating is completed before using the food. Remember to use a food thermometer to check for doneness. Food that must have time and temperature control for safety that is being microwaved should be cooked to at least 165 degrees Fahrenheit. Some examples are meat, poultry, seafood, or egg dishes. The fourth step to keeping food safe is to properly chill. You want to use a refrigerator thermometer in all fridges or walk-in coolers. Keep refrigerators stored at 40 degrees Fahrenheit or colder. Keep the freezers at zero degrees Fahrenheit or colder. Chill perishable foods promptly. Any foods that are left out at room temperature should be discarded after two hours if they are perishable. And if it's really hot outside and the temperature is over 90 degrees Fahrenheit, you'll want to discard those foods within an hour or less. Another way to follow the chill rule is to cool foods quickly. Some ways to do this include dividing large amounts of food into shallow containers before placing them in the refrigerator, taking any large cuts of meat and dividing it into smaller cuts or slices, using an ice bath to surround the container of food while stirring, or if you have access to ice paddles, stir the food using the ice paddle. The goal of all this is to avoid having foods sitting in the danger zone. The danger zone is the range of temperature between 40 degrees Fahrenheit and 140 degrees Fahrenheit. Food that require temperature and time control that are left out in this temperature range allows bacteria to multiply if they are present in the perishable foods. Examples of foods that are most likely to become unsafe include meat, poultry, fish and shellfish, eggs, milk and dairy products, baked potatoes, cooked vegetables, rice, tofu, or other soy proteins, sprouts and sprout seeds, and sliced fruits and cut vegetables. Now I'm going to turn it back over to Judy, and she's going to review some of the things we just learned. Let's review what you've learned so far by answering a few more questions. A good sanitizing solution can be made using A, one teaspoon of unscented chlorine bleach per gallon of water, B, one tablespoon of, of scented chlorine bleach per gallon of water, C, one teaspoon of scented chlorine bleach per gallon of water, or D, one tablespoon of unscented chlorine bleach per gallon of water. The answer is D, 
a good sanitizing solution for use in food preparation and serving areas can be made using one tablespoon of unscented chlorine bleach per gallon of water. This solution can be used as a spray or as a rinse. Sanitizing means that you are going one step beyond clean to destroy disease-causing microorganisms. The temperature danger zone means blank. A, cold foods should be kept at 40 degrees Fahrenheit or colder. B, hot foods should be kept at or above 140 degrees Fahrenheit. C, perishable foods or those that must have time and temperature controlled for safety should not be held in this temperature range. D, all of the above. If you answer D, all of the above, then you are correct. Now let's try our hand at some scenarios. Jackie was cooking hamburgers for lunch. She brought the patties on a plate to the grill. She sat the plate aside to use later. When the outside of the patties were browned, she removed them from the grill and placed them back on the plate. What, if anything, did Jackie do wrong in this scenario? Well, in this particular scenario, Jackie did two food handling mistakes. She did not use a food thermometer to check the internal temperature of the patties to be sure that the ground beef had reached a safe temperature of 160 degrees Fahrenheit. The only way to tell when burgers are safely cooked is to use a food thermometer. Children have died from eating undercooked ground beef that contained E. coli 0157H7 bacteria. Jackie also placed the cooked food back on a plate with raw meat juices that could have harmful microorganisms that could recontaminate the food. Let's try another. Terry made a big pot of chili the day before the parents' day lunch. That way, she could quickly warm it up for lunch the next day and be ahead of schedule. She placed the large pot of chili in the cooler overnight. The next morning, when she checked, the temperature of the chili was at 50 degrees Fahrenheit, and it still felt warm. Great, it won't take so long to warm. What, if anything, did Terry do wrong? Terry placed the large pot of chili in the cooler overnight, and large quantities of food take longer to cool to proper temperatures. Terry should have stirred the chili with an ice paddle or placed the large pot in a sink with ice and water around it and stirred the chili to cool it quickly before placing it in the cooler. Another way to cool foods quickly is to divide them into smaller quantities in shallow containers before refrigerating. At this point, Terry knows the chili is in the temperature danger zone and she does not know how long it's been there. So the safe thing to do now is to discard the chili. Let's try another one. Caroline had to rush to get the lunch ready. She cooked the lasagna in the microwave oven since it was faster. There goes the timer. Lasagna is ready. 
Caroline removes the lasagna from the microwave oven and immediately begins to scoop servings onto the children's plates. What, if anything, did she do wrong in this scenario? Caroline did not observe the stand time on the package directions. Stand time is a part of the cooking time for a microwaved product. The lasagna may have had cold spots, or it may not have reached the necessary endpoint temperature for safety without the stand time. Always observe the stand time called for on the package directions. If no stand time is listed, then a good rule of thumb is to wait at least one minute before slicing or dividing the food for serving. Now, let's turn this back over to Jessica. One of the best ways to avoid foodborne illness or food poisoning is to avoid unsafe foods. When selecting products at the store or receiving products from a supplier, you want to look at the appearance, checking the color and the freshness of meat, poultry, and seafood. You only want to purchase products from reputable sources. Look for any signs of insect or damage on fresh fruits and vegetables. Check packaging for any visible signs of moisture damage, tears, tampering, etc. And also be sure to check the dates on the packaging. If you see any signs that indicate there could be a problem, then do not purchase the product or accept it from your supplier. Another way to avoid unsafe food is to pay attention to food recalls. Food may be recalled and removed from store shelves or from the distribution chain for several reasons. For example, there may be the discovery of an organism in a product that can make consumers sick, such as the bacteria we discussed. There could be discovery of a potential allergen in a product, or mislabeling or misbranding of food. An example of mislabeling could be a food that contains an allergen, such as nuts or eggs, but those ingredients do not appear on the label of the product. In fact, many food products will have allergen warnings on their labels if they are processed and packaged in the same facility that processes other food products that contain common allergens just to make sure that allergic consumers have the information that they need. On the food label, there will be a warning that says something like, this product was processed in a facility that also processes tree nuts. So how do you get information about product recalls? Well, there are, there are several ways to get this information. Recall notices are often publicized in the news, in newspapers, on TV, radio, internet, social media. The recall information may be posted at the grocery store when you walk into the store or as a sign on the shelf. You can go to regulatory websites such as FDA, USDA, the Georgia Department of Agriculture has a recall webpage as well. Or you can visit www.recalls.gov. When you hear about a recall, it's important to check to see if you have any of the products that has been recalled. Studies show that a lot of times people will ignore food recalls or think that it doesn't apply to them. If you think you may have a recall product, you're going to want to check the product and examine the label. Match identifying marks on the product that you have with the recall notice. This can include looking at the product name, the brand name, container codes, container sizes, expiration dates, lot codes, UPC numbers, and things like that. Let's take a look at one example. Here's a sample recall notice issued by Schwartz Brothers Bakery. They're issuing an allergy alert for undeclared milk in everything bagels. The product is packed in clear four-pack plastic bags with a visible image of cheese melted on top of the bagels. The everything bagels has a specific UPC number 
and Best Buy dates of October 14th through November 10th, 2014. Take a look at this recall notice. What do you think the potential problem is with the product that's being recalled? If you said allergy alert, then you are correct. This recall notice is alerting consumers to the fact that the product may cause an allergic reaction due to milk that was used as an ingredient that was not listed on the label. In this recall, what types of products do you need to be concerned about? Is it all of the Schwartz Brothers Bakery products? If you answered Schwartz Brothers Everything Bagels, then you would be correct. Do you think you need to be concerned about all of the Everything Bagels from this company? If you said no, then you are correct. This recall notice states that the only ones to be concerned about are the Everything Bagels packed in clear four-pack plastic bags with a visible image of cheese melted on top of the bagels. It has the specific UPC number 717-887-231211 and specific Best Buy dates of 10-14, through 11 10, 2014. If you are an in-home child care provider and you have a recalled product that you purchased at the grocery store and you have not opened or served it, do not serve or eat the food. Return it to the store where you purchased the product. If you are in a child care center, you should follow state or local health department requirements for handling recalled products. You'll want to review the recall notice and those specific instructions. Hold the recalled product, but make sure that you physically separate it from other products. That includes any product that you've opened, product that is not opened, and any food that it has been used in if it was an ingredient. Mark the recalled product as do not use, do not discard. If the recalled product is from USDA's food distribution program, follow the guidelines on the previous slide and also make sure that you do not destroy USDA commodity foods without official written notification from the state distributing agency, USDA's Food Safety Inspection Service, or the state or local health department. That's because you'll be responsible for accounting for all recalled product by verifying, verifying inventory counts against your records of the foods you received. Now I'm going to turn it back over to Judy, who will walk us through another scenario. Let's review what you've learned so far. Tamika purchased cereal bars from the grocery store for the kids' snack. She just heard about a recall of the bars on the news. Oh well, it is probably not the ones she has, and it did say it's just because it may have been processed on a line that had peanuts on it that are not on the label. It will be fine, and besides, there's no time to get another snack. What, if anything, did Tamika do wrong? In this scenario, Tamika did not check the labels to see if she has the recalled product. She also did not keep a backup snack on hand. She served the product that may have had an allergen in it. And she did not discard the product or take it back to the store where she purchased it. Just as manufacturers and government agencies play a role in keeping food safe, you have a responsibility to keep food safe as well.
Keeping food safe is just one more way that we can keep children safe and well. For more information on food safety, please visit our websites at the Georgia Department of Agriculture, www.agr.georgia.gov, or UGA Extension at www.fcs.uga.edu backslash extension backslash food. This webinar was supported by a grant from the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, Food and Drug Administration. Thank you for participating in the webinar.